the penalties are stern. That's the topic of today's interview segment, a timely topic at that, because one of golf's greatest stars is out of the PGA Championship on a technicality. CNN's Bob Kurtz explains. There's no question that the biggest story here of the 63rd PGA Championships was the disqualification of Lee Trevino. Now, there was a strange set of circumstances that happened that led up to the disqualification. Uh, Trevino was playing in the same group, the same threesome as Lanny Watkins and Tom Weisskopf. They were in the scoring tent going over the cards as the golfers always do, checking it hole by hole. Trevino was done with his card when Weisskopf turned to him and said, Hey, you put down the wrong score here on the ninth hole. I had a three. And Trevino had put down a four for him, and he says, oh, you made that putt. They start talking about it. And as a consequence, Trevino forgot to sign his card, and somehow Tom Weisskopf signed Trevino's card. A strange set of circumstances, to be sure. The PGA officials, when they found out about it, felt they could do nothing. They conferred, they talked about it, but they went to the rules, and rule number 38 led to the disqualification of Trevino. You must sign your card, and the officials felt they had no other choice. Uh, to disqualify a player like Lee Trevino, who means so much to the championship and to golf, is, you know, is difficult. If you and I were promoting an event, why well, we'd look every which way rather than losing. But in this particular event, we can't. We can't do it. That's the rule, and that's called, and, and he, uh, he understands it and is in agreement with it. you got to remember, when you play golf, there's only two things that you have to do. One is you have to make sure that that you're honest with what scores you make on each hole. Put that particular number in that block for 18 holes. When you finish, you total it and you sign your name to it. And I didn't do that. I totaled it and it was correct, but I didn't sign it. And that's the rules. That was on Thursday. They disqualified Lee Trevino. The thousands of people here at the PGA Championship, of course, very upset, not able to see one of their favorites. But uh, we have him here for you now, our guest, Lee Trevino, uh, gallery favorite, known for a lot of things, for being happy-go-lucky on the course, known for one of the, the, uh, the strangest swings in all of golf. It is an unusual swing. If you look up and down the driving range, which is, which is behind the cameraman there, you will see uh, different sized players, and, but basically all swing about alike. Now, this tour has been on for years and years, and I'm the only one that's ever swung the club uh, the way that I swing it. I fell into this thing accidentally because I used to draw the ball and, and uh, hit it from right to left very bad. And, and I've always had a saying, and, and is, is you can talk to a fade, but a hook won't listen, you see. And, and so there's no sense in hooking the ball because it's very inconsistent to hook the ball and the reason for it is simply because the hands tend to pronate mm -hmm. people tend to be taught to pronate going back and then pronate going forward and what they seem to forget is that always anytime you grip a golf club you will see the face of the club and the back of the left hand point in the same direction in other words so so what do you have here is you have two golf clubs you have a face there and you have a face here it's like what you call a lettering set Mm -hmm. A wooden lettering set, and you want to make the, the, the letters over on this side the same, and, and you put the needle here, and you go up and down the letter set, and it makes them here on a board. This basically works the same way. I hit a golf ball with this golf club. <laughs> Back of your left hand. Sure, yeah. because what happens is wherever this left hand goes, that what influences that. If this left hand turns here, the club face turns. You don't, you don't hit anything from, except from an open stance. You don't close the stance well, to hook it. You can't. If you close the stance, you see... If, if you go back to, to, to the beginning of the game, which was invented over 200 years ago in Scotland, and it's been in this country, in North America, about 100 years, and if you go back that far, and if you've ever read books that have been written by different professionals, actually the, the meat of the book, the inside of the book is basically the same, whether it was written in the, in, the, in the teens, or the 20s, or the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. The only thing that's changed is the publisher's name and the pro that's on the cover. <laughs> But when you open that book, they all teach exactly the same thing. They teach right foot back of the left. They teach uh, taking the club back inside. Uh, they teach pronation. They teach releasing. They teach grip. This V going to the chin or the nose or the ear and they got this one. Now you get people out at the driving range with a book and they're going and they're looking at the book and they're going here and they're going there. And it basically has nothing to do with it. You see, the most important thing about golf is the, the acceleration of the back of the left hand to the target or parallel to the line with the target because if this accelerates to the parallel line that you want to go to then that club face has to go on that line 
Now, the reason that I that I developed the open stance is simply because it taught me acceleration. You know, the question comes here. Most uh, good players, historically, it used to come up from the caddy ranks, but mm. then now most of them come from country clubs, from sure. uh, the college ranks and so forth, and they're taught by top professionals. They learn the swing. They've read books. They, they go to all the clinics. You didn't have that advantage. How old were you when you started, and how in the world did you make the progression when you started really learning how to hit a golf ball? Well, I never really started playing golf until I was 19. Uh, I caddied. Uh, I started caddying when I was about nine, and then uh, uh, I just that's all. I didn't play, uh, and I went in the Marine Corps at the age of 17. And by the caddy experience that I had, I had, I had developed my game, what we call a sandlot game. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of sandlot football players that could probably play in the NFL, and I developed the game out there playing. Uh, after we'd go out and we'd caddy, we'd make 90 cents or 90 cents for 18 holes caddying, and then we got a dime tip, so we got a dollar. So we'd go out in the back of the caddy shed and and, uh, and start putting with bottles and, and gambling the money away or shooting mm -hmm. dice or, or whatever. And um, so I went in the Marine Corps and I carried a light 30 machine gun. I was with the 3rd Marine Division, 9th Marines in Okinawa in 1957. And in 58, uh, I was transferred to Okinawa. And uh, I saw, uh, in 1958, I saw a bulletin uh, on the, in the recreation room about tryout for the 3rd Marine Division golf team. So I tried out, 36-hole uh, play at Owasi Meadows, Sand Greens. Mm -hmm. I shot 68-77, and I made number five men, and they were taking the top six. So it all came back, and I, was, I started practicing. Well, I got out uh, on November the 10th, which is the Marine Corps birthday uh, of 1960, and I still didn't have any intentions of playing golf. Uh, I went to work at the Columbian Club in Dallas, it's a Jewish club, building a new nine. And I worked construction, mm -hmm. uh, uh, making the greens and shoveling the gravel and, and mixing the loam and peat moss and what have you, planting the grass, cutting it, uh, changing tea markers, uh, cutting greens. And I had a man come up to me named Hardy Greenwood that owned a driving range in the par three course. He said, I used to watch you hit golf balls at my driving range. And he said to me, he said, is this what you're going to do the rest of your life? He says, do you want to work on a golf course or would you like to make your living playing on it? And I says, "What do you mean?" He says, "He says you've got, he says you've got potential to be." How, how can he see that kind of talent in you, though? Because you were you weren't shooting well, those kind of numbers. Pro. No, no, he was he watched my swing. Yeah, but you didn't have, you, you you didn't have the ability to score like you. No, well, like you I I never played a complete 18 holes of golf until I was uh, I was 15 and I shot 77. I've only shot in the 80s five times in my entire life. <laughs> okay. So uh, I uh, I uh, I developed this particular thing of, of hitting. Uh, so I went to work for this man in 1961, and I practiced five years, solid practice, seven days a week, without ever playing in a golf tournament. And in 1965, I entered the Texas State Open in Sharpstown in Houston mm -hmm. and won it. Well, in my first tournament ever, I beat Frank Warden. First tournament, Jim? Yeah, first pro tournament I'd ever played in. And I won it, I beat Frank Warden in the first old playoff. And then I didn't play anymore. Oh no, that year I went to Mexico City and finished second to uh, Homero Blanca's the Mexican Open. How old were you now? At 25? Yeah, 26. 26. Yes. Uh -huh. That's an incredible late start then to yeah. think about the tour. We're going to come back in uh, just a second and we're going to tell about the, the couple of miracles in the U.S. Open when uh, Lee Trevino suddenly became a national celebrity. You stay with us. We are back with uh, Supermax, Lee Trevino. A fascinating, incredible story of a guy who uh, we've heard the story came out of uh, nowhere hitting bug did you ever really hit a ball? dr pepper dr, dr. pepper, pepper bottle, wasn't yeah. so well you see you know people seem to think because i worked for dr pepper right and sing I used to i used to sing song and dance, dance and everything you know bad and i i had a friend of mine named bobby martin which is a singer also and she was married to to my manager's brother and uh, you know she had the, the the big hit for the love of him, and mm -hmm. uh, she was a great singer. She always used to make fun of, of my singing when I did this Dr. Pepper commercial, and and my recourse was well, it was a gold album. I told her, <laughs> <laughs> I said because that's what I got paid. I got paid about as much for that you as probably. she would have gotten for a gold album. Say, why well, didn't they have you do? I'm a pepper, but, you're a pepper. That's right. <laughs> but I did. Uh, it was a Dr. Pepper because it was round, and smooth. Was it was it a quart bottle? Yeah, yeah, it was a 32 ounce. It was a big yeah. one. But a Coke bottle, in other words, is concave in the middle, and, and, and it wouldn't work. So mm -hmm. I used to, I used to tape the bottle and put a glove on the right hand and, and play a par three with it, longest hole, 120 yards. I used to take a half a stroke of hole from whoever wanted to play, which is the tie. Right. I played with it five years and never got beat. 
Never lost a match with it. Well, you, that's that's got to be the greatest hustle in the world. What kind of, no, that's what? not a hustle. See, everybody tends to to interpret hustling a complete different way. Hustling is when you have a, a 10 handicap and you tell people that you're 15. Okay. Or you have a, a 2 handicap you and you tell people. You told them what you were going to do and you did it. Well, it's a gimmick. There's a fool born every day, you know. And I used to get one out there every day. And, and you come up with a gimmick and people want to see it. You know, whenever somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I'm going to bet you I can take this card and make it flip over there. Why would you bet him? If he's going to bet you he can do that, hell he can do it. But it's like I said, there's a fool born every day that wants to see it and they don't mind paying two or three bucks. Let's that's go, what I did. Let's go from this kind of style and learning how to do golf ball and winning, it, winning your first term at Houston. Suddenly you entered the U.S. Open. You'd entered it once before. Twice. And twice uh, before, before you played so well, before you finished sixth. Yes. You entered the year before. Yes. And, 66, and you, yeah. And you weren't going to enter it in 67. No. Too but tough. I didn't think I was ready. I, I'd never witnessed rough like that. Yeah. So you go to 67, yeah. and suddenly you finish, what, sixth? Finish sixth, yeah. And did you, did it suddenly dawn on you, hey, I can play with these guys? I mean, it was like a revelation, or did you have any self-doubts before you went out there? No, I, I still, my intentions were still not to go on the tour. My intentions were to start the tour January of 68. Mm -hmm. But I got an invitation to play in the in the Western Open in Chicago and the American Golf Classic. Because of, that sixth, because of that sixth place. Of the place. sixth finish, uh, fifth place I finished. Fifth place, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and and I, w I was invited to go to the Firestone tournament, and so my wife and I, we, so we uh, we decided to go to Minneapolis-St. Paul to warm up the tournament before. Mm -hmm. We were playing Hazeltine, and I'll never forget it. I had a, a 65 uh, uh, Plymouth station wagon, and we had a little potty trainer in the back. My daughter Leslie was uh, uh, my daughter Leslie was about a uh, year and a half old, and uh, we had a little duck back there, and it just swing all the time, you know, and 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 we. We took off and we had to go across Kansas and Iowa and I never seen so much corn in my life, you know. <laughs> That's I, 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 true. But we finally got there and I qualified. It was the only time that I ever had to qualify for a golf tournament, for the exception of the U.S. Open. And um, I went there, teed it up on Monday. I was so nervous, I duck hooked it in a hedge right off the first tee, lost the ball, made seven. I shot 78 uh, qualifying and I was packing my car and, and Jack Tuthill says, where are you going? I says, oh, I says, I. I've got an invitation in Chicago. I'm going down to practice there. He said, you qualified. I said, oh, no. I said, I shot 78. He said, 83 is going to make it. At Hazeltine. At Hazeltine. Yeah. It make make this course look like a pitch and putt. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's the longest it's guy. Long. It's got four par fives over 600 yards long. You know, Trent Jones built that course, and I don't think he likes golfers. You know, I was... I, <laughs> Dave, Dave Hill's been a friend of mine for a number of years yeah, when I was out in Colorado. He said Dave, a few things yeah, about it. Yeah. Well, he said a few things about Hazeltine, right? <laughs> just, they ruined a perfectly good cow pasture. Yeah, a farm, yeah. Yeah, I should play in court here. But he was talking about playing with you. Now, this is would be 68, right? In the open. Yeah, and he said, he says he didn't know who you were. No, 67 he this played with. This was 67. Yes. He, says, he, said, he said, I was playing with him, and he says he just, you know, he says after, you know, your swing, Dave, is, Dave really knows the golf swing. That's and right. works on it yeah, so forth. That's right. And so he can recognize a good swing, but yours mm. was rather unique. He said yeah. it took him a few holes to adjust. And he says he came off and he says, this guy can play. Well, I, I, I learned to play on a public golf course where everything was extremely hard. A lot of woods, Tennyson Park there in Dallas. Uh, uh, I mean, this, yeah, I, played I mean, Tennyson it was tight. Park. I mean, you had to walk single file. If you played a foursome, you were like ducks. You were in a <laughs> row. Uh, you know, I, it was very difficult to play that golf course. So I learned to hit a low trajectory ball and, and learned to play. I've had the pleasure of winning the British Open twice, and I said that if I would have been turned professional at the age of 21, uh, if, if I would have taken the game up a little earlier and played in the British Open when I started in 21, I would have probably already won it five or six times uh -huh. because I could actually play better then than I... I really don't think that the people got to see the best. Uh, uh, I thought that I could play in 64, 65, 66 much better mm -hmm. than I can when in the 70s. You know, when you you had the, the accident, uh, the, the, the hit by lightning, mm. and so and you back problems and mm -hmm. so forth, your game suffered, mm -hmm. and you came back, and it was very interesting. A lot of people said you came back for pride, a lot of people came back for goals, but you said you, you ran into economic problems out in El Paso. You I came did. back because you, you can't make to. this kind of money anywhere else. No, I And the pressure was on again. Yeah, I love pressure. I love, uh, I love for people to say you can't do this. Uh, my caddy and I get out there all the time now, and I say, it's a six iron, and I say, he said, no, it's a five. I said, I think it's a six. He says, you can't get there. Well, hell, I'll take a <laughs> six <laughs> and just jump on it a little harder. I love the pressures. Uh, I think that's probably been the, the biggest killer of all is, is, is been success comes too easy, mm -hmm. and it did with me. And uh, I got to a point in 1974 to where 
that's when my, my game started deteriorating a little bit and and the reason is because it did come too easy first mm -hmm. tournament I played in I won 6,000 uh, I finished uh, 13 tournaments 67 I won 33,000 1968 I won the Open Hawaiian Open in 132,000 uh, contracts were coming in they were throwing money in suitcase I mean it was just unbelievable and uh, then I, I built this golf course in, in uh, in El Paso, and, and uh, it's 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 no secret. I, I lost about a million five in that particular project. Uh, and it, anytime you lose a million five, I don't care if you're Rockefeller, it puts a crunch on you. And and I had to come back and play hard. And and uh, but that's what I like. And then I, I ruptured my back, and I had the disc removed. And again, they said that I was it, I was finished. And my doctor at, uh, in Houston, uh, Doctor Antonio Moray, that operated on me, he told me, he said, you play better than ever. He mm -hmm. said, there'll be no problem. You take better care of yourself. Uh, not until after he operated on me, I found out that he was a tennis player. Hell, he knew nothing about golf. So, uh, but you play, but you probably play, him, you play I, tennis better than ever. Yeah. I told him, I said, I, said uh, uh, I told the doctor, I said, well, I said, let me tell you something. I said, if I can't play anymore, I said, you, all that stuff that you operate with, you can use in the kitchen. I said, because your, your, your reputation's on the line here. But uh, I like to be the underdog. I like to, uh, to, to, to be up against the wall. Did you, did you ever did you ever have a, uh, a moment when you when it came to you that that hey I'm I don't like to say great but realize that I am like you're gonna, you're going to be in the the Hall of Fame of golf and so forth uh, and here's a guy you know you didn't make a, a game plan to start out when you're six years old hey I'm be a great golfer like Jimmy Connors did in tennis and like a lot of the golf pros out here when did it suddenly dawn on you that you belong among the golfing greats Oh you, you never do you, you never do I mean you you tend to get that title from people from public from media. Uh, from television, uh, about uh, you just happen to be one of the good players in that particular time. But you got to remember, if you if you stick a pin in me, I bleed. Mm -hmm. uh, I hurt as much as everyone else. I get depressed. I like to drink. Uh, I do. I do everything that other people like to do. Were you were you hurt? Uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, psychologically, or did it hurt your feelings or anything? When when, when Sports Illustrated came out with this. Uh article about you recently which said that uh, you know went into kind of uh, one your financial difficulty but also said that uh, that you're not the happy-go-lucky that people first people say you are that uh, that you get off by yourself that you you're a loner in the evenings after the rounds and yeah so they're forth. right I told him all that why would I be heard I'd be hurting myself wouldn't I well, no, I, I am I am I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, a hermit uh, when uh, when after I leave the golf course I, I don't like to be around people when I leave the golf course I I feel like I give it my thousand percent when I'm out on the golf course. Uh, I, I make people laugh. It makes me happy. Mm -hmm. But when I leave here and, and I go home, I go into my room and I have all my meals in the room. I don't want to see anybody. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like I've done what, what I wanted to do. Uh, people have enjoyed it. And, uh, and now it's my time. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just like you or, or anyone that's watching here. They have times that they want privacy. Uh, how many times have these people stand around and says, honey, let's go to some quiet place and have dinner? Yeah, That's my room. Because I see you can, uh, I It's see the only place you can, I can have dinner with and be quiet. If I go to a public restaurant, uh, in other words, uh, uh, people knowing how I am, uh, in other words, on the golf course, happy-go-lucky, they say, right. oh, hell, he won't mind. Let's go over and, hey, Lee, how you doing? And you got the, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and then you say, oh, he says, how you doing? God, I want you to meet my wife. Come on over here at the table and hit, you know, and you're sitting there, and I don't want to put up with that stuff. And then they say, well, wait a minute, hold then, it right there. There's my grandmother. I got a camera right here. Wait a minute, the flash. Of, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I, I want to be, what I just said a moment ago, when you said about realizing of being great. Hey, I, I'm just a guy that, that golfers, are not made. Golfers are born, and athletes are born. You can, I can show you people up there that'll practice five times harder than I, had it five times easier, and and can't and, and their support can't pay attention. And the reason for it is because they, they just don't have the talent to play. Now, it just so happens that that you fall into a category to where you're going to be a good player and make a lot at whatever you're doing. And and I, it's somewhere along the line, that's me. And that's Nicholas, and that's Watson, and, and, and Palmer, and Player, and all those guys. Now, I, I don't know anything about that, but privacy, I want it just like everybody else. When I go home, or when I go to a hotel, and I walk through a hotel to register, hey, I don't want anybody running over at me and, 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 and sticking books in my mouth and saying, sign this to my grandmother and this to my two kids, and come outside, I want to take a picture of you and your manager, and this. hey, I, I, 
I, you know, you, I want to have some privacy. Well, you, and I guess of all those guys, you certainly rank as one of the uh, one of the all-time greats. We thank you very much for being with us. Lee Trevino, Supermax. And you got to give Lee Trevino a lot of credit. I mean, here a guy gets kicked out of, out of the biggest you know event left in the season, an opportunity to make a lot of money. He doesn't even complain. He's one of, oh, he's a class guy, and he's one of the brightest sunbursts of a man that the golf tournament has seen, the golf tour has seen in a while. I mean, you know, Arnie and Jack and. Watson, I mean, they've got their admirers, but this guy is something else. And, you know, based